So moving on to our second speaker, um, it's a real pleasure for me to uh, introduce uh, our second speaker, uh, Tosin Alului, uh, who has just recently submitted his PhD, actually, um, and has been part of the Centre for Humanitarian Leadership here at Deakin. Um, it's been um, a real, um, it's been terrific to see Tosin um, move through his PhD. Um, I was uh, involved and have been involved with him right through since the day one of his PhD, and it's a real delight to see uh, what he's achieved in that time. Um, so today he's going to be talking about uh, his mixed methods study, which focused on the health implications of conflict-related sexual violence against men. And prior to his candidature, Atosin um, obtained a Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery degree in Nigeria, where he also practised clinically and then um, completed his Masters of Public Health also here at Deakin University uh, before moving on to his PhD. Uh, he's passionate about public health research uh, in the humanitarian sector. And today he'll be talking about um, his PhD work and looking at the guidelines for qualitative research of a sensitive subject in the humanitarian sector. So Tosin, over to you. I thank you, Sonia. Um... Good afternoon, everyone. Morning, evening, depending on um, what part of the world you're hearing me from. Like Sonia said, my name is Tosin Olalwe. I uh, just recently submitted my PhD thesis at the Center for Humanitarian Leadership in Deakin University, where I looked at um, the different forms, the determinants, and the health implications of sexual violence perpetrated against men. Uh, in conflict as well as in post-conflict settings. So um, I work with South Sudanese men who are currently living, or who at the time were living in um, two resettlement communities in Uganda, that's in East Africa. And um, my study was a mixed matter study. Um, so the what, what, before going for that study, I, I mean, studying my research, my PhD, had conversations with people and the general belief was that person you're not likely to be able to get anything out of this study nobody is going to talk to you no man is going to talk to you about sexual violence uh, there were a lot of discouragement here and there and it got worse when i you know read literature and i realized that uh, most of the discussions around sexual violence as it affects men were sort of based on information provided by either aid workers or female uh, survivors of sexual violence. And I just felt like it was important to hear the, side, the story from the owners of the experience. So I decided, okay, I was gonna do this study. And uh, um, eventually I had a good study, um, had, a good, uh, had good findings after spending about a year or thereabout for my two, the two aspects of my study. And um, I just thought it would be nice if I come up with guidelines that can be used based on the experiences in my research to uh, sort of conduct studies on sensitive subjects like sexual violence. And on, um, in my own case, I also worked with a, a particularly difficult to reach population. Like I said earlier, there is that general belief that men generally would not want to talk about their experience of sexual violence. And I'm sure most people will agree with that. So this whole presentation is based on my study what I found, what was easy for me in my research and what I believe can be used to study other sensitive subjects um, in the humanitarian sector settings. Um, so I'm just gonna start with that um, quote by Santosh Kaur that says, trust, uh, trust starts with the truth and hence with the truth. And you'll see why I chose that uh, uh, quote in a bit. Like I said, I looked at sexual violence against men and that was sort of the focus of my study. Now, I'm sure the question that will probably come to everyone's mind is, um, why not just leave these people alone? If a man has experienced sexual violence, I mean, if people have been sexually violated, why not just leave them alone? Uh, I actually believe, yeah, it's okay not to bother people. It's okay not to disturb people. You know, despite, I mean, based on the fact that you've had some not too good experience. But the truth is that, the fact that a subject is sensitive does not preclude people from having such experiences. For instance, perpetrators of sexual violence do not care whether 
sexual violence insensitive or not. They still go ahead to perpetrate sexual violence, still go ahead to rape men, still go ahead to rape women. And so um, when that happens, it is normal that there will be consequences especially on the people's, um, the, the victims or the survivors health in my, uh, in my own context, I'll just focus on health. I know there are obviously several other consequences. Um, the consequences on your physical health, your sexual health, your, their, um, their, sec their, their mental health, even their social health. And the thing is when they, when they as they experience all of these consequences, they move into the humanitarian um, settings in the refugee camps and the rest of them. And once they get to the humanitarian settings, it becomes incumbent on us as humanitarians to provide support based on some of the principles of humanitarianism, which we are all aware of. So, um, I mean, we need to provide support and I'm sure everyone here will agree with me that the most appropriate support needs to be evidence-based. If you're gonna develop a policy or a program to support people, it needs to be absolutely based on evidence. And I, I, I dare to say it needs to be based on quality evidence. But the question is, what is quality evidence? Now, I'm aware that the WHO says, um, as much as possible, don't um, interview or don't talk to survivors of sexual violence. I'm quite aware of that. But I also believe that if we are interested in quality evidence, if we are interested in rich, um, rich data, then it's important for us to talk to the owners of the experience. The, um, and as I found in my study, there actually is a bit of um, the, the, there's a bit of discordance between what humanitarian aid workers think about sexual violence against men and what the owners of experience out of the experience think. And that's why I feel, I and my supervisors actually feel that it is important to um, sort of talk to the owners of the experience themselves. And based on my um, experience talking to this um, male survivors of sexual violence in Rhino and Mvepi camp in Uganda. I came up with five guidelines that I'm just gonna talk about in the next um, 10 minutes or thereabout. All of these guidelines, I need to say, re revolve around the word trust, revolve around trust relationships. Um, the first one I would like to talk about is the need to spend time in the community prior to recruitment. I'm sure you can, I, you can see my screen. That's me in Rhino camp. Um, one of the days when I went there. So in my case, I was there for about four weeks prior to recruitment. And I think, um, yeah, the general tendency is to believe that um, spending time in the community is gonna be a waste of time. I mean, but I, I, one of the main things I'd like to propose here is for researchers, whether you are part of, um, whether you are uh, humanitarian, uh, humanitarian aid worker working in that community or an outsider coming to do research in that community, it's important to um, in, inculcate this into the research design itself. So as you're planning the time of the research, plan into the time that you need to spend time in the community before you start recruiting uh, these people at all. And I'm gonna share why in most of the other steps that I will be talking about. As a matter of fact, this step was the most, um, the single most important step in my research. Um, one of the things you get to do while you spend time in the community is to learn about the people's culture, about their beliefs, about their interests. And of course, we know, we will agree, I'm sure everybody will agree, that learning about their culture, learning about what they believe in is one of those things that will help us conduct a culturally sensitive research or culturally safe research, which I believe that everybody is interested in. We've been hearing a lot um, about things like this. There is a need to um, conduct research that, acts, that is acceptable to the people. And um, yeah, it's important to do scoping review or sorry, scoping visits um, prior to designing the study. But at this stage too, it's also important to get them involved, understand them a little better. You would also get to learn about their interests. And um, there are some other things that you will do, but as I go on, I'm just gonna to refer to this first step again, um, because all the other things that you would do before talking to the participants will actually happen or should happen in this first um, stage. So the first thing I would say, or sorry, the second step, yeah, is to develop a relationship with community leaders and stakeholders. Now there is an existing um, relationship of distrust be between researchers and uh, the, the participants of research, particularly in the humanitarian sector. The literature is filled with um, stories about that. There is a history of distrust that exists. And you wouldn't blame them for the, for the distrust. That is because uh, prior to now, or even up until this time, um, researchers have gone to the humanitarian settings to talk to people, 
and um, sort of at the end of their research to go out there to write papers, not bothering about the people, generally they harm people. And so the tendency is for community leaders to feel the need to protect their men, to feel the need to protect their people. As a matter of fact, before conducting my study, I read a study like that, where the researcher actually went to the field to conduct research and basically went to the community leaders to start asking them to nominate people to take part in their research. And they just told the researcher that, oh no, uh, these men are not going to talk about their experience. But the researcher eventually found out after all of this that the men were actually more willing to talk about their experience than although um, they were not able to talk to them, they were not able to talk to so many of them. But the truth is that barrier that exists was a major problem. So when we, in, um, one of the ways to get these um, leaders to trust researchers, even if you are already a humanitarian aid worker working in the field, um, don't just assume that the fact that I'm working in the field, they naturally trust me. The truth is I found that they trust um, organizations, NGOs, they trust us, um, NGOs for food, for shelter, for, for a lot of things. But when it comes to very sensitive issues about their experiences, they don't share. They don't, they don't trust people enough. Okay, um, but if you can win the, the trust of their leaders, and one way to do that is to discuss with them um, discuss their culture with them, discuss their tradition, and discuss the research in detail. And I must emphasize truthfully, the, the, um, discuss the research in details. Tell them about the benefits of the research. If there is no immediate benefit, make sure they are aware of um, the fact that the benefits are not immediate. If there are going to be potential side effects, definitely in this case, I mean, in this case, there will be possible re-traumatization, you want to talk to them about it and you want to talk to them about the plans to mitigate this um, sort of effect. So the third thing I'll talk about because my time is running is um, to choose appropriate gatekeepers. When I was going for my study, I thought I was going to use humanitarian aid workers as my gatekeepers. Gatekeepers are essentially people that I talk to that help me get access to the people I want to interview that like we all know. And um, that beautiful house there, is where I intend to go to. But if I don't get through that gate, I'm not going to get through those people. Now, when I was going for my research, I decided I was going to use humanitarian aid workers. But I must say that throughout the four months that I spent doing my qualitative research, all of the um, aid workers, that I, the, the organizations that I wanted to use could not nominate a single participant. Why? Not because they didn't want to nominate, but because they don't know these people. They didn't have male survivors of sexual violence that they could um, direct me to. But I mean, I was glad that I also included the community leaders. And the question is, who, how do we identify who uh, will be an appropriate gatekeeper? Again, we come to the issue of trust. You need to look for people that these survivors of sexual violence or the people you want to interview, you need to look for the people that they trust. I found that these people have a good trust. And this is one of the things I found during my four weeks in, that, in, the, in the community. I found that they trust their community leaders a lot. And I use those community leaders. The truth is that when you establish a good relationship with the community leaders, they actually stop being mere onlookers in your research. They actually become collaborative and help you identify, um, identify your possible um, participants, the participants for your study. And with the benefit of hindsight, I also want to suggest um, religious leaders are also very important people because I found that um, survivors of sexual violence, almost all of them all would tell me that, oh, they've been to their pastor or their mom, they've spoken with them or their religious leader um, for whatever religion they practice um, at the time. So the next step is to develop um, a trust relationship with the participants. Can I say that it is important and I deliberately separated developing a trust relationship with leaders and with participants. It is important not to go directly to the participants, but to develop a relationship first for strategic reasons and of course for ethical reasons, to develop a relationship first with the community leaders. Now, what, what I found was that the relationship I developed with the community leaders sort of reflected on me. I mean, these men, the, the survivors of sexual violence that participated in my study, trust their community leaders. And I just, my going there was basically like, um, I'm sorry, I'm not showing, I mean, for obvious reasons, I can't show the picture of anybody. Um, but when I talked to, to, once they know that, oh, this guy coming has a good relationship with our community leaders and with the youth leaders, they, 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 it gives me a bit of, uh, it imposes in me or imposes in me a bit of trust 
that you have. And of course, after that, I want to also make sure I sort of expand on that trust relationship. And one way you can do that is to make them as comfortable as possible. Let them choose the place you want to do the interview. And again, some of the things that you learned during the um, that end during the four weeks that I spent prior to data collection um, recruitment was also helpful. For instance, I learned about their interests. I realized that South Sudanese men generally like um, soccer. So, I mean, whenever I want to talk to them, of course, I also learned some of their languages. So whenever they came into the room, I basically greet them in Arabic. I don't know Arabic, but I learned some of the key words when I was spending those four weeks there. And, you know, I just greet them in Arabic and I saw that they always share up. You know, it's like, oh, are you from South Sudan? How do you know our language? And the rest of them, they were always interested in talking about soccer. Of course, that does not mean I didn't show empathy. I also still maintain, you know, that empathy, but I wanted to make them feel very comfortable and to be able to, you know, talk to me um, comfortably. Another thing I would say is when you're asking questions about a sensitive topic like this, you don't want to go ahead straight and ask them to tell you about your sexual violence experience. Most likely, they're going to traumatize them immediately. Something I did was to just ask them to talk about their experiences. Generally, I'm sure most of us know this, um, which, I mean, once I asked them, I found out that a lot of them actually eased into talking about the experience of sexual violence, even without me asking. And um, there were also some forms of sexual violence that they did not regard as sexual violence. But once I asked, they told me, um, once they got into talking, they mentioned those things. And the final step is to use snowballing technique. I'm sure we all know that snowballing technique is the gold standard, sort of the gold standard when you're trying to reach a difficult to reach population. But again, I must say that um, the snowballing technique will only work if you develop a good trust relationship. I mean, I'm not gonna, tell a friend of mine to come to attend your study if I don't feel comfortable with you, if I don't feel I can trust you. So you need to, and I must also say that the reason why snowballing technique will work is because survivors of sexual violence talk to one another. So just to wrap this up, I would say that if you wanna know the truth about a sensitive subject in the humanitarian setting, you need to truthfully develop a trust relationship. Can I say that my study was actually highly successful in the sense that at the time I was done or I got to data saturation, I still had quite a number of men that were still willing to take part in the study, despite the fact that, I mean, several people say men would not want to talk to me. And one other thing I found was that a lot of the participants were more than willing to share their experience. And after sharing, some of them actually said they felt better, which means that talking about it is actually, can be harmful, but if done properly, can also be very therapeutic, or at least therapeutic. Maybe um, I stretch the word very. So uh, just a list of my supervisors and myself participated in, um, contributed to this study and to this presentation. Um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>